Today's daf we're going to learn is is Ketubo Daf Pevav. Um, you might have seen it on our Facebook or Instagram. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it yet this morning, but today's daf is the 1,000th daf of Shas. Very exciting. Um, big accomplishment for everybody here, even if you haven't done all 1,000. Um, today's daf is sponsored by the Hadron Hebrew Zoom Learners in honor of the 1,000th daf of this cycle. In honor of Rabbi Michelle, who paves the way for us by making the Talmud and its concepts accessible, by learning with us day in, day out, with a woman's perspective, unfazed by difficulties along the way, and always with a smile. Okay, with that, let's get started with our daf. Um, we're going to get started right now with the, and obviously all our learners get a lot of credit for this thousand daphim that we've learned together. Um, okay, let's get started with, we, today is one of these a bit of a disjointed daf. We're going to have a lot of different sections and different parts to it. Um, I just want to start with this interesting story of the relatives of Rav Nachman. This story is incredibly parallel to a story, not the content, but the structure of it, to a story we saw with Rabbi Yochanan and his relatives, if you might remember. And we're going to see he well, we'll go through the story and then I'm sure you'll remember the details. Again, not the details necessarily of the story of what exactly he advised, but it was a story where he advised his relatives and then felt bad about it. Okay, so here goes. Krivte de Rav Nachman, Zabin Tubata betovatana. So a relative of Rav Nachman, maybe we should review quickly where we started. We were in the middle of this very complicated topic. In fact, Gefet is on it this week, which I was happy to see. It was a very difficult topic to write Gefet. They go much more in-depth, which is good. We don't have the time to always do that. There's this topic that we ended with of somebody sells a promissory note. So I'm owed money by, by someone, and I sell you the rights to collect that loan. All right, let's say it's not due yet, and I want the money now. I'm, I'm strapped for cash. So I sell it to you. You give me money right now. You're going to pay me less than the value of the loan because otherwise, what's the point, right? You're going to basically, let's say it was thousand dollars, you're going to pay me, let's say, seven fifty. You're going to give me seven hundred fifty dollars for that thousand dollar loan. So I get the seven hundred fifty now. I'm happy. You later will collect a thousand on it, so you'll gain something. Otherwise, there's no point for you to buy it. And great, everything sounds perfect. What's the problem? The problem is that according to the Gemara here, according to Shmuel, Shmuel says that I have the right to basically cancel the loan if the borrower comes to me and says, "Listen, can you just..." You know, you lent me this money, can you just let it go? And I say, yeah, sure, no problem. Now, for me, it's no skin off my back. I sold the promissory note. For you, it's a huge loss. Okay, so we talked about yesterday that you can eventually come back to me and claim the money. We're going to learn today that not everybody even thinks that, okay, which makes it even more crazy. Um, so Rabbi El Shavoni talks about and get that, that some people think that selling a promissory note is not actually something you could really sell by Torah law, and maybe that's why. It's not even a valid transaction, okay? And therefore, you've done it, it has validity, but it's not really, you can't really sell it. A star isn't really, it's just a piece of paper. You can't really sell it by Torah law, which would then maybe explain a little bit better how this could happen. In any case, the point is that if you have a loan outstanding and you sell your promissory note to someone else and that someone owes you money, you can cancel that loan and that person will be left with nothing. You have to remember, when you bought this promissory note, there's a bit of risk attached because you never really know if you're going to get money back from someone. Right? There's always a bit of a risk. So in this case, right, you got really messed up. So Rav Nachman has this female relative who basically sold the rights to Ketubah, which is very similar. It's like a promissory note, right? We've been comparing this whole Mishnah, the, the, the people who are owed money from the husband, the creditors, right? And the woman, she's owed her Ketubah. Her tuba is worth money. Now here it's an even riskier transaction because the husband might die after the wife, which would mean that he already inherits the tuba, and then you've bought her tuba, and you basically don't get anything because you're only going to get her tuba money if it happens that the woman gets her tuba money. She gets her tuba money if she dies, if she dies second, meaning he dies first, or he divorces her. So you bought it betovat hana'a, meaning he bought it for not a lot of money from this relative of Rav Nachman. What happened? Igarsha. Well, in fact, the husband divorced her, so she was supposed to get her ketubah money, which means the person who bought it was supposed to get the ketubah money. Ushchiva. Now, in the meantime, she dies. So who's in charge of this now? Who comes in her place? Well, she doesn't have any sons, so she has a daughter. Atu katavele So they went to get the money from the daughter. 
the person who bought the, the, the ketuba from the mother goes to the daughter and says, listen, go get your ketuba money and give it to me. Well, Amar Luhu Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman says in this very kind of, uh, you'll see, I can't think of the word how to describe it, but you'll see in a minute, Leka de Lisbalait says, there's no one who can give my relative some advice. He's basically talking in a way that he wants her to hear, but without actually saying it directly to her. So he says, is there no one who can give her some good halachic advice? Okay, how so? What should she do? Tezo v'tichle l'ktubata. She should go and forego the ktuba money. Go to her father, who's supposed to pay her the ktuba money in place of her mother. Go to the father and say, right? Tichle l'ktuba di'ima l'gabe'avua. Go to the father and say, you know what? I'm not going to bother collecting the ktuba money. You can keep it. Viter tamine. And then what will happen? When he dies, right? The assumption is probably he'll die before her. When he dies, she'll inherit it. Okay? So she has nothing to lose in doing this. Because in any case, she's not going to get the ketubah money. So why doesn't she just forego the ketubah? The husband will then come in. I'm sorry, the father will keep the ketubah money. Eventually he'll die. She'll inherit it. Right? And in the worst case, she dies first. Okay, well, she hasn't lost anything. So... Shama Azla Achilta. So she hears this. Okay, obviously he meant for her to hear it when he said it. And, right, either some people who were with him heard and told her, or she overheard him saying this. So she went and she was mochel, okay, mochelet, she forego, foregoed on the ketubah. Amar Rav Nachman. Now, what happened was, so basically, this person who bought the ketubah, betovat hana'ah, and ended up with nothing. And she... And her father ended up with the money in his hands, and eventually, hopefully, it'll go to her. So Rav Nachman gave her this good advice. But Amal Rav Nachman, afterwards, Rav Nachman regretted. Okay, we're in the time of Yom Kippur, leading up to Yom Kippur, and regrets, and thinking back, and saying, maybe we shouldn't have done that. So he comes and says, Asinu atzmenu ke'orche hadayanim. You'll probably remember this, because right, Rav, Rav Yochanan said the same thing. After he advised his relatives, he then felt guilty and said, well, you know, I've become like a lawyer and advising my relatives to do things using these halachic loopholes to do things that basically are cheating other people out of their money. So the Kumara asked exactly what they asked Rabbi Yochanan at the time, which was, my my What was he thinking originally that he did this? And then what did he think in the end? What made him shift? In the beginning, he thought, quoting this pasuk in Yeshayahu, right, Yeshayahu, which says, you shouldn't ignore your relatives. In other words, he knew this halachic solution, and he felt it was his imperative to tell his relatives, because we're supposed to take care of our relatives. But in the end, he realized that he's a prominent person. And in the position of a prominent person to teach. Now, here's a good question. What's wrong with this is a prominent person? Either forgetting that it was his relative, maybe just teaching halachic loopholes to cheat other people out of money is not a good thing for a prominent person to be doing. Or helping your relatives to cheat other people is also not an appropriate thing for a prominent person to be doing, right? Either which way, whether it means this or it means that, both are really not appropriate. And basically, he said, I'm in a certain position where I am. I shouldn't really be doing things like this. So he regretted what he did. The question is, you know, it seems like it was too late. You know, and that's what's interesting as you think about Yamim Noraim and the, you know, Yom Kippur coming up. You know, there's certain things we regret that we can undo. And there's certain things that we can't really undo. In this case, I assume it was really too late. Once she did it, it was done. There was not much that could be done. Okay, Gufa. Now we're going to have... Uh, uh, advice about what Shmuel said. If you're going to buy a promissory note, how can you protect yourself from somebody using this halakhic loophole against you? So gufa. Gufa means we're going to go a little bit more in depth into something we said before. So we're going to again quote Shmuel, Amr Shmuel. This is just a quote from what we saw at the end of yesterday's stuff. Somebody sells a promissory note to his friend and he then goes and foregoes on the loan. Machul. It's effective. Afilu yoresh mochel, even someone who inherits, right, the meaning, I sold you the promissory note, and my heirs come in, I'm, I'm no longer alive, my heirs come in, they can even forego the loan. Uh, so that's just a quote from what we saw yesterday. Here comes the new 
addition. Amar Rav Huna Bered Rav Yoshua, V'i Pikach Hu, if he's smart, this is the way the rabbis give advice to people. They say, if you're going to be smart about it, here's what you should do. Right, we've seen this a whole bunch of times. Mikarkesh Lezuze, he should shake some money in front of his face, right? This is, you know, when you want to get something done, you kind of pull out a little bit of cash and give them a little extra money. So if I, if I sell you this promissory note, you basically should go, if you're smart, go to the borrower and pay him a little bit of money to write a star, to agree basically, to write the document with your name on it. Once your name is on it, then if I forego the loan, it doesn't really have anything to do with you anymore. Okay? So uh, it doesn't have anything to do with me anymore. It's now between the two of you. It's a question among the commentaries exactly how we can rewrite this loan because if we re rewrite it as a new document, then it weakens your position because you want to be able to claim it from property that was in my right that was in the the borrower's possession from the date that I had the loan with him, right? So you don't want to write a whole new document, but what you want to do is kind of add your name in somehow, okay? Not write a whole new document as if you loaned him the money. That wouldn't be very smart because you'd lose out. But you could somehow, okay, and that's exactly like a bit of a discussion what exactly you do, but somehow add your name in so that your name is there. And then if I forego the loan, nothing really will, uh, that won't change anything. Another thing, which is the real issue, which is we talked about yesterday, do I have to compensate you now? Do I have to pay you the amount? Okay, this is a good question now. Let's say it was a loan for $1,000. This actually isn't discussed in the Gemara explicitly, but I'll, I'll raise this as a question. I loaned you $1,000. Um, I sold it to you for $1,000. Uh, sorry. It was a loan for $1,000. I sold it to you for seven fifty. dollars let's say. Because again, uh, if I want the money now, and right, there's no reason you would buy a promissory note for $1,000 for $1,000. It wouldn't make any sense. You wouldn't gain anything and you'd just be out of money right now. So obviously I sold it to you for less. So now I've caused you damage. Now, what damage have I caused you? Have I caused you $750 worth of damage or $1,000 worth of damage? It's a good question. But the Gemara is discussing in general the damage that I caused you. Right now, you can't collect your $1,000, okay? So probably I'd have to pay you $1,000 even though I only, right, it's a good question. Even though I only pay, I only got 750. But um, the Gemara doesn't deal with that at all. But Amar Amemar, and he says the following. Man didain dina digarmi. Okay, dina digarmi is something that comes up in Nazikin, which is damages that are caused indirectly. Basically, I caused you damages indirectly, okay? How you define indirect is a good question. Because if it's indirect and it's definite, I don't know how indirect this is, because this clearly caused you a loss. But we're going to view this as indirect damages, because I did one action of canceling the loan, and it caused you damage of not being able to collect. So it's indirect. So now, Amemar says the world splits into two. There's people or judges and courts where they collect indirect damages, and there's courts that don't believe in that. It's Machloka, Rabbi Meir, and the rabbis in, in uh, I think it's in Baba Kama. Yeah, in Baba Kama. Um, yeah. Um, Rabbi Meir holds Dina de Garme, and the rabbis don't. So we have this split. So basically, he says, Man de Dina de Garme, if it's a court that does hold by indirect damages, Mag Bebe de Meshtari Ma'alia. They collect the full value of the document, which sounds like the $1,000 actually. Sounds like he would collect the full damage that was now caused him. Man de lo dain dina de garme, but anyone who doesn't hold that, if they don't, mag me be de me niara ba'alma. There's a bit of a debate what this means, but basically what it means is you get either almost nothing or nothing because all you have is a piece of paper in your hand. The piece of paper is worth nothing. So you can't claim anything. It's only indirect damages. All you have is the paper in your hand, which is worth the value of a piece of paper, and that's about it. And therefore... Right, you basically end up with nothing. So we end up with this split that you could theoretically try to claim damages, but only if you go to a court where they are willing to charge someone for indirect damages. Some courts won't charge anyone, and then you're really stuck. So Hava Uvda, they're not going to end with just that, though. There was a case, Vekafia Rafram le Rav Ashi. He forced Rafram, who's Rafram Bar Papa, we know him from the Siyum, right? He's one of the sons of Rav Papa. He forced Rav Ashi to 
charge damages in this case. It sounds like Ravashi didn't really want to, and he forced him to. But Agbe Bey Kishur, Ki Kishur Litzalmi. And he may, and Rav Ashi collected the damages for this person. That is, it wasn't him. He was the judge. He made the person who for, for went on the loan, he made him pay, okay, there's an interesting phrase, like the beam of a, a sculptor, okay, which is very precise. And he made him pay the precise amount of what he had caused, the damages. Okay, there's another interpretation of Kafir Rafram Lorav Ashi in Babakama, and that's I'm going to leave that as an open question that you can listen to Gethet and see what it has to do there. And everybody else, Shimoni, connected specifically that issue to tshuva for children. What if you do something as a child? Do you need to repent for it later when you get older? It's a very interesting topic. So that's part of what Gethet is all about this week. Amar Amemar, I think it's not up on the site yet. We only got it last night. Hopefully it'll go up today. It's a Friday, so no promises. But if not, it'll be up the beginning of next week. Okay. Amar Amemar Mishmei Derav Chama. Hi, and by the way, it's up in Hebrew already. Hi, okay. We're like I said today, we're gonna to move topics. So our first topic was this thing, was this topic of someone who had a loan and can you know basically canceled the loan, had sold it the promissory note, etc. Now we're gonna go on to a different thing, which is if you remember, the topic of our Mishnah was a person dies and has creditors and a woman who wants to get her tuba money, and the Orphans. And the question is, who gets first dibs, right? We have Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Tarfon. Is it the Koshil Shabinahim? Is it the, the orphans? Okay, so now we get to a topic where the person is actually still alive. Amor Amemar Mishmei de Rav Chama. So Amemar says in the name of Rav Chama, Hai man di ika alei ketubah isha u balchov. Someone's supposed to pay his wife's ketubah, let's say he divorced her, and he has a balchov. Okay, he has someone, a creditor. And he has land and he has money. So if it's the Balchov, the creditor, so the creditor lent him money, he gets back the money. The woman they pay with land. Because we always said the right that land is used to collect the chuba money. Each one according to what is appropriate for them. But what if there's only one piece of land? And it's only enough for one of them to collect. So who gets it? Now, if you remember, and this is going to be a little bit complicated, if you remember, we talked about before, once he's dead and one of them grabs it, right, who gets it? It was a whole question. Rabbi Tarfon said, whoever right, grabs it can get it, okay? And then Rabbi Akiva said, what are you talking about? It goes to the orphans. But then Rabbi Tarfon also had this Dean about the koshel shabinihem. And we had a question, who's the koshel? Who's the weaker? So one opinion was it's the weaker proof. The one who has the weaker proof, meaning the one whose, whose document is dated the later date. But Rabbi Yochanan had said, it's the woman. Why the woman? We're going to go more toward the side of the woman because of Khina. What was Khina? To ensure that she get married. Right? We'll go with Rashi for right now, even though Tosfot has a bit of a different approach, but it's still the same idea, which is, in order to encourage her to get married, Rashi says, we're going to make it easy to collect her tuba so that she'll be encouraged to get married. She'll know that she has easy access to her money. This suk is going to say the exact opposite, okay? Who has, who really has first rights to it? The creditor gets it, not the woman. My taima. More than a man wants to get married, a woman wants to be married. Okay, meaning women always, this goes more with Tov Lametav Tandum and Lametav Ormalu, which is women would always rather be married than right, sit together with two rather than by herself. And therefore, we don't need to encourage her by making it easier for her to collect her tuba. So in the event that there's only one piece of land, the Balchov gets it and not the woman. And why is that? They're missing the real important part, which is the main reason. A Balchov is normally someone who loaned money. Now, if we don't let the Balchov get his money back easily, if it's going to be him or the wife, the wife, he's not going to lend money. It's not worth it for him, right? If I can't get my money back, why would I lend money? So basically, this is what we call Shalotin Ol Delip Ifni Lovim. We're now standing, we just finished the Shemitah year. We're all supposed to sign Prusbal documents. Hope you did. In any case, that's to allow you to collect your loans despite the fact that the Shemitah comes and cancels them. Because if we didn't do that, no one would ever want to lend money out because they would know every time the Shemitah year would come, nobody would pay them back. And there's all sorts of things they did in order to prevent 
the situation that people will stop lending, loaning money to people. It's very important. So that overrides this issue of the woman. How does that connect with the Sugyan Pei that we just saw about Rabbi Yochanan who said, Bishubchino, we're going to make it easier for the woman to collect? So, um, Tosfo basically raises this question. I want to suggest, okay, I'll, I'll read you Tosfo's answer. I see Ruth, you're writing something that Rashi says. Rashi says it would have to be that they were written on the same day. Okay, not everybody agrees with this. Um, it happens to be an opinion of Rashi. Okay, I actually have it underlined in my Gemara, so I'm glad you reminded me. I wanted to say it. I don't always notice while I'm teaching. Rashi says in the last line of Yotem Misha Ish Rotze, Rashi says, Aval im kadma zmana ktuba hi gova. Okay, if her ktuba day was earlier, it's only in the case that they were both on the same day. It's very hard to really say that that's the pshat here because it's not what it says. Not everybody agrees with Rashi, but it is interesting to note Rashi. Rashi tries to come up with a way that the woman could still collect it by saying, only if they were on the same day, but if her date was earlier, then she collected. Um, any case, we still have this issue with the other sugya. So Tosfot raises it in Lishalo Yavina Le. Tosfot raises the question, which is a very obvious question. Um, and he distinguishes this case is when the person's still alive, and that case is after death. So he says, when you loan money to somebody, you're not worried oh, in the event that they die, I'm going to have to collect it from their orphans and then the woman will get it before me. So in the event of after death, the woman has first dibs because we want it. she is obviously expecting to collect her too, but after the death of the husband. She's already imagining, right? The 50%, right? There's either he's going to divorce her or he's going to die. And she probably assumes that she's getting married. You know, he'll probably die rather than divorce me. They're about to get married. They're not really thinking of divorce. And not that she's thinking of her husband's death either, but you know, you do think forward of when I'll get my tuba money. That's something she's thinking about, and therefore we're going to make it easier for her to collect after death. But when you loan money to somebody, you're not thinking, what if they die and I have to collect it from their orphans? No, that's not really what's on your mind. You're just thinking of getting your money back. So this is a regular situation. You're worried, what if they don't have money to pay me back? And what if they have to pay something else at the same time? So that's where we're going to give strength. In this case, it's an interesting answer. I wouldn't say it resolves the issue entirely. Um, another possibility is there there was a machloket, and that was Rabbi Yochanan, and this Gemara thinks otherwise, and it's interesting to see different approaches. Do they think women are always just willing to get married and don't really care about their financial situation? They're just happy to be getting married because they feel like that already protects them. They're not worried going forward. Or maybe other people say, no, no, no. Women are very concerned with their financial stability going forward, and they are worried even at the time of marriage. What if the marriage ends, and how am I going to get my tuba money? And, and maybe it would prevent them. So it could be that there's different approaches as to, and that was Rabbi Yochanan, and this is, you know, let's remember there, Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Hanina disagree with Rabbi Yochanan, maybe because he didn't hold this issue of Khina. So anyway, it's not just there that Rabbi Yochanan says it. Khina comes up a whole bunch of times. And we do see that they try to make it easier for the woman to collect her tuba in all sorts of situations, but maybe not when it's in conflict with something that's even more important, okay? Which again, that's sugya with the same two people, so it's harder to say. But again, it could be different approaches. Um, okay, we'll leave that question aside now and move forward. Amar le Rav Papa le Rav Chama. Vada'i, okay, Rav Papa goes to Rav Chama right now and says, I heard you say something in the name of Rav, is it really true? So, vada'i da amalitu, is it really true what you said? Mishme de Rava, in the name of Rava. Hai man de maske be suze, vi Someone's owed money, and the love has land. Ve'atabalch, right, the borrower has land. Ve'atabalch, ove katava mine. And the creditor comes and says, give me back my money. Ve'amale, zil shkol me'ara. Let's say it's me and you, I lent you money, I loaned you money. You come and you say, okay, take my land. Amrina le, can I say to him, in other words, I heard you say this in the name of Rava, that I can go say to you, to her, let's say, zil zabin at va'ayte havli. You go sell the land and give me the money. I loan you money. I want money back. Don't give me land. If you give me land, I'll have to go sell the land. We all know it's not so easy to sell property. It depends on the, the market. But, you know, it's a, no matter what, it's a headache. So the headache's on you. You sell the property and give me the money. Is it true that you can force him to do that? Amrle, lo. Said, I never said that. So, Amali Gufa de Uvda Hechehavi. So, Rav Papa says, but there was a case where you did that. So, tell me the details of the case and let me understand this is always a good lesson. And be careful when you learn from a situation that happened, it might have unique circumstances that basically make that 
that the judgment was in a particular manner because of that particular case, and you can't necessarily learn from it to all other cases. So Rav Papa had heard about some case. He hadn't heard the details, and he just heard that Rav Chama said, Rava said that he can force the person to sell the property, the borrower, in order to pay back the money. So what was the case? Oh, it was a case where, let's say, you were the borrower. You didn't want to pay me back, so what did you do? You sold your land to a non-Jew. Now, by selling your land to a non-Jew, what happens now? I, normally, if you sell your land to a Jew, I can go collect it. It's nechassim shu'abadim. It's lean property. But when you sell it to a non-Jew, and this is a good question. I didn't really figure this out exactly. Either I'm just scared to go collect it from him. In other words, it's, it's true it was lean, but go try telling this non-Jew. Remember, their relations with non-Jews, at least according to some sugyot, were a little bit dangerous and you know that you don't want to get them too upset they might do something back at you so therefore he was scared to go to him and claim back his land and therefore what did he say therefore he said okay so the Gemara says here who has Sasha Loka Hogan now he sold the property of the Gentile just to right or he gave it to him just to basically not have assets so that he wouldn't have to pay back the loan so that was inappropriate so the Ficha Hasubo Shaloka Hogan and therefore they treated him they went against the law and basically required him to do something that normally you're not required to do by law, which is they forced him to get the land back, sell the land or, you know, get the money for it and give it to, um, he, by the way, I don't think he sold it to the Gentile. I think he just gave it to him and said, say this is in your name and that way I won't have any land to my name and they won't be able to collect this loan back. So therefore they forced him to go back and sell it. Another reason I was thinking the Gentile might just not care about you know, that's like in our Jewish system of law. But he could say, oh, I don't, I don't, you know, your liens don't mean anything to me. And, you know, try to prove it in a court of non-Jewish law. And maybe you, he, it was something you couldn't really prove. Maybe they don't, they didn't have those same rules. I don't know. Um, that's why it could be just he was scared of him. And really, it could have been in a court of law, could have been ruled. But he didn't really want to start up with that. Okay. So basically, you learn from this a bunch of things, right? Don't hear partially about uh, the the bottom line of a situation without understanding the details because you can really get confused about what the law is. At least our papa was smart enough to ask him when he heard something that sounded so not believable because in general we've learned you can pay back with land. So there'd be no reason that you'd have to force the borrower to sell the land. That's why you said incredulous. Did you really say this? Amale Rav Kahana the Rav Papa. Another incredulous thing in today's stuff. Okay, a lot of things today are, are very surprising, right? Number one, surprising that you could forego on this loan. That's number one, after you sold a promissory note to someone. Number two, that, you know, here this situation. He thought, what? You could, you, you could force the borrower to sell his property? Number three, this is, I, I found this surprising. Amalei Rav Kahana Rav Papa. L'ditach amart priyat chov mitzvah. According to you, Rav Papa, you hold that paying back a loan is a mitzvah. Now, when we say mitzvah, mitzvah means a good thing to do kind of thing. It means that it's not a chova. There's reshut, which is optional. It's not optional. There's mitzvah, which is it's important thing to do. And then there's chova, which is obligatory. So you say it's not obligatory, really. You say it's a mitzvah. So if so, amar li, amar lo nicha le mitzvah. What if someone says I don't want to pay back that loan. Lo bali, as we say in Hebrew, right? I'm just not interested. My, can we for, enforce this or not, right? Normally you can enforce something that's an obligation. Amalei, Tanina, he says, well, I'm going to prove it from here. There's halacha. Torah says when you get lashes, which is usually because you did some negative commandment, and they give you lashes. Arba'im yakenu lo yosif. You get 40, which really they explain is 39. You can't add any more. You can't do more than that. So, in what case is it that you can't do more than 40 if you're doing, if it was because of a negative command? Very surprising line. You ready for this? If it's a positive commandment, okay, I told you we're going to have two relevant things today, not just regret about the past in Yom Kippur, but also sukkah. If they say build a sukkah and you don't do it, or lulav, pick up lulav, make the bracha, Ve'enosen, you don't do it. Makin oto ad chetetze nafsho. Very harsh line. They can give you lashes until, chetetze nafsho sounds like until you die. Okay, so nobody really thinks it's until you die. We don't 
kill you to do this. But the point is that you're not limited in the 40. You can keep going until the person says, okay, okay, I'll build my sukkah, I'll take my lulav. Okay, so if you have anyone here who doesn't take a lulav, beware that nobody comes knocking on your door and forcing you to do this. Okay, anyway, as a woman, you can claim exemption, um, although I do encourage it despite that. In any case, what's besides surprising, which we can just assume is an exaggeration, what it means is there's no limit, okay? But usually we're much more strict with somebody transgressing a negative commandment than somebody not fulfilling a positive commandment. And this source seems to say the opposite of what we in general see, whoever said there were lashes for not doing a positive mitzvah, right? So it's a very surprising statement. Um, so in any case, the point is that if, okay, if you see someone who's about to not do something, it sounds like you can give them lashes, which means on that power, we can give lashes to someone who hasn't returned alone. Now, it seems to me, even though you can do this, I don't think the court generally does this, although in the case of a loan, you could see they would do this. In other words, not building a sukkah, not taking a lulav. I don't see the courts going around knocking on people's doors, making sure that they do those things, and if not, give them lashes. But when there's someone else at stake here and they're not giving back their loan, then I could see them fulfilling that. So the fact that this source says you can do it doesn't necessarily mean they did do it. I think that's the way it makes more sense to me, but it's, it's definitely a, a, an interesting source and surprising. Now we're getting back to a different topic that we've seen already, which is um, we now have, okay, I see you're asking Adina about a get. Before I move on, it's interesting because our next topic is get. That's why it came up. But um, a get is different because there's no mitzvah to give a get. It's not like there's a mitzvah associated with giving a get. It's not a positive um, commandment. So it's different. Um, even though they do, there are, I mean, we saw already that by law you really can beat people up, although there's limitations on when and how and all that. And and again, despite the fact that legally you can, generally they don't do it. They don't think that it's a good method of, of uh, getting someone to do something or they don't want to use it. Okay. We're now going back to, we have this argument, Rabbi Tarf and Rabbi Akiva, about if you grab something, is it valid, is it not? Right? Does it always go to the, right? Rabbi Akiva said there's no rachamim in the deen. We, we don't have any mercy and judgment. It goes to the inheritors, the heirs, even if you grabbed it. But Rabbi Tarfan said if you grabbed it, it's yours. Now, grabbed it where? We said in the public domain. So now, on that topic, we're going to get off on a totally different question, which is, Rami Barchama asked Rav Chist, If somebody says, this is your get, V'lo titgar shibo I only want you to use it for divorce. And that's, you're going to, this document, I'm giving it to you today. It's the whole importance of giving over the get to the woman. But it's only going to go into effect in 30 days. So she accepted the get. She puts it on the side of her shudarabim. Okay, if you've ever gone to the cardo in the old city, so there's a, like a strip where all the stores are. And then there's the space on the side which isn't a, a thoroughfare where everybody's walking through, but it's a little space on the side where some people would do some individual business. It's kind of in between public domain and private domain. So that's going to be the big question. It's now in this area, which is questionable exactly how we view it. So is that considered, in other words, if it's in the public domain on day number 30, when it's supposed to go into effect, it's in the public domain. It's not in her domain. But if it's in this side area, then maybe that would be considered, again, is it public? And then it wouldn't be a valid get. There seems to be this assumption that on day 30, it has to be in her domain when it goes into effect. So, Amrle, there's a bit of a debate about exactly what he said and what the wording was. I'm not going to get into all the details here, but know that there's more to it than what meets the eye. Amrle, ain't a megureshet. She's not divorced. How so? Mi deravu shmuel, deravu shmuel de travayu. She's not divorced because it's like Rav and Shmuel. They said it has to be in Rashid Arabim, right? This is the opposite. In order to be able to be to face, it had to be in a public domain. And they assume that the Tzidei Rashid Arabim are just like Rashid Arabim. So since Rav and Shmuel talk about it in, in right, it's the opposite context, there we needed it to be in the public domain in order to grab it because it was in no man's land. So this was also in no man's land, which means she's not divorced. To which the Gemara says, Ah, Rabbah, you could say, Based on what Rav Nachman, you could say, she is divorced. Why? 
To Amar of Nachman, Amar Rabba Baravua. This also we saw just before. Haomer lechavero mishoch parazo, velo tiek nuyalcha ala harshloshim yom. Pull this para, which is an act of acquisition, but it's not going to be yours for another 30 days. This is very, very similar. Lachar shloshim yom kana. Okay, so oh, sorry, uh, kana, period. He, he acquired this cow. Vafilu omede bagam. Even if the cow is standing in this swamp. So, my love, hainu agam, hainu tzidei rishida rabim. They say, isn't the agam just like rishida rabim? Which would mean, it's as it was not public enough that it could be considered in his domain. Likewise, the Tzidye Rashid Rabim are not public enough that we could consider the Geddes in her domain. To which the Gemara rejects that suggestion and says, Lo, Agam Lechu V'Tzidye Rashid Rabim Lechu. No, those are two totally different things. Agam is more private. A swamp is a more private space than the size of Rashid Rabim. Again, because it's right next to the public domain and people from the public domain kind of go into there, that already makes it more like a public domain. That's the first version of the sugya, which basically says, in this case, she's not going to be divorced. Ika de Amre, but some people say it was the exact reverse. Okay, we started there with Rav and Shmuel. We tried to reject it based on Rav Nachman, and then we reinstated Rav and Shmuel. So now we're going to do the exact reverse. Ika de Amre, Amre le Megureshet, me de Rav Nachman, but si de Rishida Rabim, ke Agam Dami. They first suggested that she's divorced like Rav Nachman, and without quoting the whole case again, but they're going to say, just like in the Agam, in the swamp, it was his, also the Tzidei Rishad Arabim will consider it hers. To which the Gemara rejects and says, Ad Rav, I know you could say the reverse. Ain't a Megoresh Amidu Rav and Shmuel. Based on what Rav and Shmuel said, it's more like Rishad Arabim. My love, Hainu Rishad Arabim, Hainu Tzidei Rishad Arabim. Isn't the sides of Rishad Arabim like, wouldn't they have the same rules as Rishad Arabim, the public domain? To which the Gemara then rejects, lo, Rishid Arabim L'chut, but today Rishid Arabim L'chut. No, the sides of Rishid Arabim are not like the Rishid Arabim itself, and therefore it would be more like the Agam case, and therefore she is divorced. So we have the exact opposite sugyo, two different versions of what this was about. Now we move on to our next topic. We're still dealing with husband and wife, and right, we started with this issue of if he writes to her, Right, I don't want to have anything to do with your property, etc., or your payroll, or this. Now we're going to talk about a, a man who puts his wife in charge of his money while they're alive. He basically put her in charge of the store, let's say, okay, for typical in those days, possibly, or at least what the rabbis are discussing, or the guy wanted to learn, so he put his wife in charge of the store. Or... If he was good with money stuff, he put her in charge of handling his money. Fascinating thing. He can make her swear anytime he wants. He can basically say, look, I put you in charge, but I don't fully trust you. Okay, hard to imagine. And he basically is going to make her take an oath from time to time, whenever he wants, that she's handling things properly, that she didn't take some for herself, give some to her family members, Okay, he can make her swear. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Afilu al pilcha ali sata. Even about the wool that she spins and even about the dough that she makes, a husband can make his wife take a shvua. Now these go back to that mission of all the jobs the woman's supposed to do in the house, spinning the wool, baking the bread, right? So he can make her take an oath anytime he wants, according to Rabbi Eliezer, about those things. To which the Gemara asks right away, Yibai Lihu. Rabbi Eliezer, al yidei gilgul kama or lechatchila kama? What is gilgul? Gilgul is when, in general, the rabbis did not like people taking oaths. Okay, even though oaths were clearly very popular, we have an entire masechet just on nidarim vows. That's our next one, and we have an entire masechet, which is going to be much later, on shvuot, on swears, oaths. So this clearly was much more prevalent than it is nowadays. That's why we do hatarat nidarim and kol nidre this time of year because people at one point took a lot of vows. So, but despite that, they were very hesitant to take oaths. Oaths use the name of God, and you don't like to take an oath for no reason. So there's a concept called Gilgul Shvua, which is if you have to take an oath for something, by law, so then we have no choice, we can also, once you're already using God's name and swear and making this oath, we can add on all sorts of things that we maybe want to check also, 
Okay, the, the, on their own, they wouldn't be able to require you to take an oath. But since you're already doing it, Gilgal is at Legalgal to roll it in. We'll just roll in a bunch of other things. So when he says, Rabbi Eliezer, that even on the wool that she spins or on her dough, does he mean if she's working in your store and you anyway are giving her an oath about that, so you can add on that, or or does he mean, no, she's not working for you at all. You're just worried that maybe she's taking some of the wool and giving it to her family members or something, and you want her to swear. So that's a big question. I'm Rulo the Rebbe Eliezer. Now, this is very interesting that they say this, and it's going to be a mantra that we've seen many times, a line that we've seen a lot. Ain adam nar, dar im nachash b'kfifa. Right? You wouldn't put a person into small quarters with a snake. And therefore, how could you possibly require, a, a, enable a husband to make his wife take oaths on basic items, the dough she makes, the, the wool she spins. This is like, okay, first of all, we've seen this term already a few times, and which is very interesting in and of itself, right? We're in this mesechet of all these contractual requirements of husband and wives, and it seems very, um, very uh, legalistic. And yet, come these lines and they realize, and they make you realize that, no, they're talking about real life people, and they're talking about real life relationships, and that is a very unhealthy relationship if a husband is going to make his wife swear all the time about the wool she she spins and the dough that she's that she's making for him. So that's a crazy way to have them stay married. So you can't force a woman to be in a relationship like that. That's just not healthy. And it reminds us of the Lohi Nachtabat Avram Avinu right? There'd be no woman under Avram Avinu, right? And the whole family of Avraham, all the Jewish people who would ever stay married to her husband in those circumstances. That was with the covering of the hair, right? So anyway, these lines really are indicative of that they understand there's a relationship here and we're not just talking about legal rights. So Iyamar Bishlama, now what does this prove? Well, if you say Lechatchila Shapir, if you say he can just make her swear any time, then it makes sense because that's exactly what the rabbis are saying. You can't possibly make her swear all the time. But Ia Martha Ide Gilgul, where she's obligated an oath anyway, like she's working in a store, that already the rabbis don't think is so difficult. Mainaf Galamina. Well, then why would he say that? Right? So, so they say, right? That wouldn't be, if, if she anyway has to take a shvua about the store, so he can add that. That wouldn't be torturous for the woman to stay in a relationship like that. To which the Gemara says, very interestingly, no. You can't prove that. Why? Even that is torturous. If I'm working in my husband's store and he makes me take an oath for that, that I can get. But if he's going to add on while I'm anyway making that oath and say, well, swear also about the, the wool and swear also about the dough, damra, she could say, lay to him, you're being super crazy with me. You're making me swear to you about every little thing. I can't live with that. Okay, so even if you're already taking an oath, it's not the taking of an oath that's so bad. It's that he's not trusting you about anything, even little things in the house. I understand in the store, okay, I'm handling a lot of money. It's, it's a business, okay, but don't go so far as to, to start bothering me about the basic household duties that I'm doing. So that doesn't prove what Rabbi Lezer thinks. Tashma, let's try from this source. That's going to be the next Mishnah, where a husband exempts his wife from ever having to swear. They make an agreement before the wedding. I won't ever make you take an oath or a vow. Let's say he didn't do that, is how this bright starts off. And therefore, and he put him in, her in the store or to be in charge of his money. He can make her take an oath anytime he wants. But if not, he can't. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Apapi, now notice what he says here. Even though, lo shivachem bani, lo mina bitropia, even if she wasn't in charge of the store, she wasn't administra the administrator of his funds, harezem mashbiya, kozman shiyotzeh. He can make her take an oath anytime he wants. So clearly, it's not just Gilgul Shvua, it's even lechatchila. She'en lechaisha, shalom naseit ha bitropia, sha'a ha pachaya ba'ala, al pachaya ba'ali sata. Because he basically says, a woman, her basic jobs are using his stuff, right? And producing things from it. So the nature of her relationship and her, her, it, the whole nature of it is she's using his funds basically and managing them even just in a small way by making food for him. This reminds us of the mission of the woman who feeds him food that she didn't take the tithes of and all that. So Abu Lo, they said to him, okay, if you're asking what happened to trust, so this is exactly what the rabbi said. It's crazy what you're requiring. 
That shows no trust, no anything. You can't, a woman can't live with a husband who doesn't trust her and is going to be constantly questioning her every move. So therefore, shmamina, lechatchila shmamina. Okay? It must be now, Rabbi Eliezer, remember, we don't hold like Rabbi Eliezer. He has a unique approach, which is the husband can demand this. But the rabbis are very against this and only allow it in unique circumstances where she's actually managing his money. Next mission, and this is very similar to the structure of the first mission in the chapter where we're going to have one case and then build on it and build on it and build on it. Katavla, if he wrote to her, they made an agreement before the marriage, I promise you that I will not make you take a vow or an oath through, throughout your, you know, from me to you. So notice what he's saying, I will not force you. Okay, he can't ever make her take an oath because he promised her. But notice he didn't include her heirs or someone who's, uh, who has power of attorney for her. Someone comes in her place, he can make them take an oath. If he says, case number two, but if he includes the heirs and anyone else who's a power, you know, has power of attorney for her, because then he already specified that. But once he dies, and other people, he only said me. He didn't say, and my heirs. So therefore, later, once he's dead, they can actually insist that she take an oath or a vow. If he says, not me, not anyone who comes in place of me, not my heirs. And, right, and then he says, this is the complete statement. Then I know Then he and all the people who come after him and she and all the people who come after her, no one can make anybody take an oath. Last case for today. Halchami kever ba'ala la if she goes straight from the grave, let's say he said, I will not make you take a shvua. And then she goes from there, the first case, okay, where he didn't include the heirs. And then she goes straight from there to her father's house, meaning she has nothing to do anymore with his property. Oh, she goes back to her father-in-law's house, but she wasn't in charge of the funds at all. They can't make her swear at all because there's nothing for her to swear about. She never handled the money. But Imna, and they can't go back to things from the lifetime because he had promised. No. Imna seta pitropia, hayorshim ashbi inota al ha'atid lavo, ve emashbi inota al mashava. But if after his death she became an apitropia, then they can make her take a shvua on what's coming because he didn't include them in the, in the statement, because we're going back to the first case, but not retroactively. They can't go back and make her swear on things that happened during the husband's lifetime. They can't say, go back to 2020 and what did, you know, you, with the year you were handling the story then, did you blah, blah, blah. They can't make her do that. They can make her swear moving forward, but not going backward. Okay, we'll get more into detail in this Mishnah uh, in tomorrow's stuff. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Mazal Tov on the thousandth daf, if you've been learning from the beginning, even if you've skipped a few or uh, didn't do the beginning, wherever you're up to, Mazal Tov and your accomplishments, you should be proud. You can go uh, see our Facebook post to add some comments to get traction going. And wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom.